Matthew 25, beginning at verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. And all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Please bow with me for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we do not know the day or the hour when our Lord Jesus shall return. And so we pray that you would help us to be vigilant and wise, not like these foolish virgins in this story, but instead be like the, the wise ones and keep our lamps lit. We pray, God in heaven, that today you would convert the lost, that you would please restore backsliders, that you would strengthen and unify your church all the more, that the word of God would be preached with power, pointing to Jesus Christ so that sinners would be saved and your church would be edified. Please anoint, Father, this activity of preaching, and it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. This is the Olivet Discourse, which began in chapter 24. It, was, uh, it started as a response to a question that the disciples asked. Jesus indicated that Jerusalem would be destroyed, and the disciples asked the question in verse 3. After that, they said, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? I've already mentioned that's basically three questions in one, and now we've gotten to the portion where Jesus is talking about the second coming. They're looking out over Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. They see the temple before them in the valley. And they sit upon the Mount of Olives and they listen to this very important teaching of our Lord. Chapter 24, verse 36 through 44 is a warning, a warning to be ready of the second coming of Jesus Christ, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Chapter 24, verse 45 through 51 tells us how to be ready, that is, you must be faithful to discharge the duties that the Lord has given you, for you do not know the day nor the hour. And then today, we have another warning to be ready in a parable of ten virgins waiting for a bridegroom. This is a parable, a parable that was used of our Lord to illustrate this very important principle, and that is, you do not know the day nor the hour, so be ready. Are you ready? That's the question. Now, weddings, we have to understand a little bit of background to make sense of this. But weddings were high points of social life in the small, small communities scattered across the Judean countryside. And they were especially high points in social life for young girls who were invited to be in the wedding party. You know how young girls are, and they would have looked up to the brides and admired brides as they've seen them walking by their entire lives, thinking about their own weddings, thinking about how beautiful the bride looks and imagining themselves in her place with her beautiful gown. And looking upon this bride, what they would have done is they would have thought, wow, wouldn't it be lovely to be part of a wedding party? And so these ten virgins are ten such bridesmaids, young women who were invited to be part of the wedding party. The role of the bridesmaids, which were ten virgins here, was to wait with the bride for the arrival of the groom. Now, the groom would arrive at night with his groomsmen to get his bride. She would be in her house. She would be waiting for him. And when he arrived, he would fetch his bride, and they, the groomsmen and the bridesmaids, the ten virgins, would escort the bride and the groom to the place of the wedding feast. 
As they walked through the town at night, the village at night, they would all have lit torches or lit lamps. So there was a, a torch lit processional from the house of the bride to the place of the wedding feast. And as they walked through the, the community with their lit torches, their lit lamps, those lit lamps and lit torches would bring honor to the bride and the bridegroom, and they would call out in the processional, inviting people to come to the wedding party. This was part of the pageantry and the pomp of the wedding. The torches here called lamps were to show the way and were to add to the glory of the wedding event to the groom and his bride as they lit the streets in procession to the place of this wedding feast. Young ladies and young girls would have dreamed of being such bridesmaids and to be invited to be the bridesmaid in a wedding festivity was a place of social honor and social standing that very few would have been given. And so these young ladies, these ten virgins, were women of honor, young ladies of honor, who were invited to be so close to the festivities, to see the bride up front, to dress up in the attire, spending their whole day in preparation for the event, and then to be among the chosen few, to carry the torch as the bride and the groom proceeded through the dark streets, and they lit the streets for them to carry the torch to the place of the wedding feast. And this is the story of ten bridesmaids waiting with the bride for the groom to arrive. So together, those ten bridesmaids, those ten virgins, would escort the bride and the groom to the actual feast of the wedding. The story itself illustrates the absolute need to be ready for the arrival of Jesus Christ. Just as these young bridesmaids, as they're called, the young virgins, were waiting for the arrival of the, broom, of the groom, you and I should be waiting for the arrival of Jesus Christ. And just as five of them were ready, you and I should be ready. And just as five of them were not ready, you and I are warned that we must be ready. We must like, be like the bride, bridesmaids that were ready, and don't you dare be like the bridesmaids that weren't ready. Ten virgins. Now, they're called ten virgins because they were young women, probably about 14 or 15 years old, young unmarried women who had not defiled themselves with sexual immorality. And they themselves were among the chosen to bring honor to the bride and to the groom on that day. Five bridesmaids, five virgins were ready, five were not. And the text has one point, one point, two words, one point. And you guessed it if you've been with us long enough. The two words are, be ready, be ready. Now, I'm not going to, because this is simply a story, I'm going to tell the story. I divided the sermon up in my mind, working through the text piece by piece, but really, it's got one point, and you'll just have to follow along with that one point as we go through this story, and we'll get to some application there at the end. I won't divide it up into multiple points. I'm giving you one point, and we're just going to walk through this with this one very important point in mind. Be ready. And I'm asking you this question. Are you ready to meet your Maker? Are you ready to meet Christ? And this most important question should be at the forefront of our minds all the time, and especially as I preach through this little portion of Scripture. We start by looking at the young virgins, the bridesmaids who prepare for the wedding. We get into our text in verse 1, chapter 25, and what does it say? It says, "...in the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins." Jesus tells us this will explain a dynamic of the kingdom of heaven. This aspect, given the context, deals with the second coming of Jesus Christ, as I've already noted, moving into this text several weeks ago. We've moved into the section of the Olivet Discourse that deals with the second coming of Jesus Christ. The second coming of Jesus Christ, this very important aspect of the kingdom of heaven, will be like this parable. 
It'll be just like it. This aspect is compared, or, or it's, it is compared to bridesmaids in a wedding party, here called the ten virgins. Here's what Jesus says. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins, like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. The number ten establishes a quorum among the Jews, so it's a significant number. It establishes a quorum. In fact, you might not know this, but the reason that after the the first lockdown that we had, they never went down to religious gathering limits below the number 10 ever again in Ontario. The first one was five, but they never went below number 10. And that's because the Orthodox Jewish community in Toronto insisted as much that they not go below the number of 10 because they needed 10 people to establish a quorum. And this is so in the Jewish religion. I don't know why it's so, but it is so that they require a number of 10 to establish a quorum. And there were 10 virgins in this wedding party. The word virgin refers to young women, likely in their mid-teens, ages 14 and 15, who've kept themselves from sexual immorality. This is the same word that refers to the Virgin Mary at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, a young, unmarried woman who has kept herself from men. She is a virgin. And these are ten virgins who have been picked by the bride and the groom to escort them through the streets with lit lamps as part of the honor and the pomp of a wedding ceremony. The lamps in this text are more likely torches, more likely torches that you would hold up and they would be fueled by a cloth that is soaked with oil and they would continually burn until they got to the place of the wedding festivities. The word in our text is that the ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. The word there for meet is a Greek word that is often used to signify the meeting of dignitaries. And therefore, we are told from the outset by the use and employment of that word that these bridegrooms have an important task because they have been appointed. They are the select few who have been appointed to carry out a sacred duty. And that is the sacred duty of meeting the bridegroom as he meets his bride and to escort them to the place of the feast. And the bridegroom, of course, is a groom. And their job was to take him and his bride through the streets by night with torchlight. And their presence, the presence of the young virgins with the, the lamps that were lit or the torches that were lit, their presence brought honor to this new young couple. And so... As Jesus introduces to us this aspect of the kingdom of heaven and gives us a parable to describe it, what we have are ten virgins preparing for the arrival of a bridegroom for their role in the wedding. But as they prepare, there is a difference between the ten. They're not all the same. They all start out the same. But they don't all finish the same. Verse 2 says... Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The word for wise there is a word you should recognize because if you go all the way back up to verse 45 of chapter 24, it, the question is asked in last week's text, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? The wise servant... The wise servant is the servant who does his job and is ready for his master's service. These girls had one job and one job alone, and that was to keep the lamps lit. That was their job. That was their sacred duty. That was their holy responsibility. The entire wedding, the entire processional was riding on their shoulders. They had one job, make Sure, the lamps are lit. That was it. And there was wise ones. But not only was there wise ones, but there were foolish ones also. And the difference is that five had no oil and five had oil. Look at verses 3 through 4. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Verse 3, for when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. 
The torches would have required oil reserves to keep burning. Therefore, half did the job rightly, and half did the job only half rightly, which is wrong. A job half done is not done. And so they didn't get her done. They only did, they only went half the distance. They didn't go the full distance. And I think it's very likely that what they would have thought in their mind is, well, you know, maybe this groom, he's probably going to show up a little earlier in the evening, so we got enough oil to get us to that point. But they made no plans for what would happen if he showed up late. And what happened? Well, he showed up late. And therefore, when he showed up late, they were not ready. They prepared for a wedding, at least five did, but half of them weren't prepared enough. They all prepared. Keep that in mind. Every one of those young ladies, every one of those virgins, they got up that morning, they got dressed for the wedding, they got their makeup done for the wedding, they got their hair done for the wedding, every one of them got a torch. And I guarantee you, every one of them had oil for the torch. But half of them didn't have enough oil. And so by the time the groom showed up, all the oil would burn out. They were that close to the whole thing, but they never made it. They weren't prepared. Well, the bridegroom arrives as they sleep in verse 5. It says, as the bridegroom was delayed, they all came, became drowsy, and slept. You could imagine. You could imagine why they became drowsy and slept, because he had delayed. That's what it said. The whole idea of them delaying indicates that the second coming of Jesus Christ will there be quite the amount of time between the first coming and the second coming. There, there will be a delay. And the longer this goes on, the more you wonder if he'll even come. There will be a delay. But the crazy thing about the delay, the thing you need to keep in mind about the delay, is you don't know how long the delay is going to be. And so you've got to be ready for him to arrive at any moment. Jesus consistently preps us for that. He preps us. You do not know the day or the hour, right? You do not know the day or the hour. You do not know the day nor the hour. Therefore, be ready. Therefore, be ready. Therefore, be ready. Therefore, be ready. Well, they fall asleep. And you can imagine why they fell asleep, because it would have been a long day. What do you do on a wedding day? Well, you get up, especially the women, and they prepare, they get their makeup done, they get their hair done, they get the dresses on just right. They're very excited about the big event. All these women that have been working all day on getting ready for this wedding, and finally it looks like the groom's supposed to come, and he doesn't come. And you can imagine the excitement. Is it this minute? Is it 15 minutes? Is it half an hour? Is it, is, it, is it 45 minutes? And every minute that goes by, and every time that second hand goes around the clock, they're wondering, is it time? And so they're all on the edge of the seat, especially these young girls. This is my moment. And finally, the excitement turns into exhaustion. After all the time getting done up and beautified for this wedding, the groom does not show up. And what do they do? They fall asleep, understandably so. Finally, he arrives at midnight, verse 6. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Somebody met at the door. Maybe it was one of the groomsmen. Maybe it was someone who was attending the door. We don't know. We're not meant to know, but simply the, the word went out. The girls, the young ladies were sleeping. The virgins were sleeping. The word goes out. Here he is. He's arrived. And they all wake up. Here's their moment of glory. It's finally come. They get to go through the streets to the place of the wedding festivities. They get to meet the bride and the groom. They get to sit at the table of honor in the wedding. And they get to feast like kings and queens together in this place of honor. The moment arrives. And as they awake to fulfill their job in the wedding party, to escort the couple by torchlight through the streets to the place of festivities where it is about to begin, they are each responsible to have their torches lit. They had one job, these young ladies. One job the virgins had. And what was the job? Keep the lamps lit. That was it. One thing. You think they could get that right. But 
What happens in verse 7? They all prepare their lamps. They get up. They get the lamps ready. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. That simply means that they got the lamps ready. I don't know exactly what's involved with the trimming of the lamp, but I, know, I do know enough to know that that simply means that as they woke up, they got everything ready and they lit the lamps. And what happens when you light a lamp that has a little bit of oil in it, but not enough oil in it? Just a little bit of oil in the wick or a little bit of oil in the cloth. Well, it will light, and it will light for maybe 30 seconds. It will light for maybe a couple minutes, but very quickly it will die out. And so you could picture there were five of them that they lit the lamp and it just stayed burning, and there were five of them that lit the lamp and it died out. And then panic seizes them, and there's a conversation between the wise and the foolish in verse 8 where the virgins without oil um, talk to the ones and have a question for the ones who do have oil in verse 8. Look at what it says. And a foolish said to the wise, verse 8, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Now, I suspect that they hadn't anticipated that the groom would take this long. So the foolish ones didn't bring oil reserves to fuel their lamps. They had let their lamps burn, and now there was no oil left. So the ones with no oil left turned to the ones with oil, the five with no oil turn to the ones with oil and they say, can we borrow some oil? It's a reasonable request and you'd think the neighborly thing to do would be like, of course. But look at what the focus of the wise virgins is. Verse 9, but the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough oil for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. The word will not in there, since there will not be enough, is a double negative, which I've told you in the Greek simply means emphatic. Will not, 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 not be enough. Do you see? They're not being unneighborly when they say, no, you can't have our oil. No, no, not at all are they being unneighborly. What they're doing is they're indicating that their focus is so on their duty that they know if they give away any of their oil, their own duties won't be discharged. And their lamps will burn out too. And they really want to honor this bridegroom. They got one job, and that's to keep their lamps lit. And they didn't do their, or the ones that didn't do their job aren't going to bring the other ones down. And so they'd rather that the bridegroom get to the place of the wedding with just five lamps lit than no lamps lit at all. Because they know if they divvy up the, the, the oil with the other ones who didn't bring enough oil, what's going to happen is they're all going to run out of oil and they're not going to make it through the whole processional. And it's going to wreck this beautiful day that's been planned for this beautiful bride and her handsome groom. So there's this double negative. Some think it's a curt response on behalf of the wise virgins. It's not. The wise virgins are concerned about doing their job properly, and they know that they'll all run out of oil if they share the oil and thus dishonor the, the bridegroom. So verse 9 tells us there will not be enough oil for us and for you. That ought to tell you something right there. And you ought to pay attention to that because you cannot rely on the faith of others, friends, family, parents, whatever, on the day of judgment. The faith of your parents will not be enough to get you into heaven on Judgment Day. And the faith of your friends or of your pastor or the rest of the people in the church will not get you into heaven. This isn't about whether the people around you are prepared. You might take comfort in the fact that someone around you is prepared. No, no, no. The, the question is, are you prepared? Are you as an individual prepared? You ready to meet Jesus Christ? Are your lamps lit? Because if your lamps aren't lit, you're not ready. So I sure hope you're ready. And the ones who are converted, listen to this, because I think this is so important. The ones who are truly converted are most concerned about their Savior, and they're more concerned about their Savior than they are about the ones whose lamps aren't lit. I mean, there's a part of these ones with lit lamps. They could have felt guilty for not giving the other ones their oil. Right? Oh, well, maybe I should. No, no. No, they're most concerned about doing their job. 
They're most concerned that the bridegroom gets honor. They're most concerned about the bride and the bridegroom. They're most concerned about doing the duty that they've been assigned to. Even more concerned are they about doing their duty and caring for the bride and the bridegroom. They're more concerned about that than they are concerned about the young women, the young virgins who didn't bring enough oil for their lamps. So let that be a lesson to you. Your number one concern is not what the people around you think. It's not all the yapping and chitter-chatter. It's not what they're doing with your, with your emotions. Your, your number one concern is not the emotional state of the people around you. Your number one concern is your Savior and the glory of Christ and those virgins who were ready, the wise virgins. Well, they understood that. But this story ends tragically for the foolish virgins. It's a tragedy because the foolish virgins are presented as inactive amongst a lot of action. Inactive amongst a lot of action. Look at verse 10 and just look at how, how it's parsed out as far as the wording goes. And while they were going to buy, like that's not even, that's not even a full sentence. And while they were going to buy. The only thing that the foolish virgins do is while they were going to buy. And look at happens, what happens while they were going to buy. You know, the wise virgins said, go buy some oil. Well, by the way, who has oil at midnight? Like if you're going to go buy, buy oil at midnight, it's too late. The store's closed. There's no oil. But anyway, they go out on their fruitless mission. And while they were going to buy, look at all the action. While they were going to buy. The bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Three big, strong, piercing verbs. While they were going to buy oil, the bridegroom came. The ones who were ready went. The door was shut. You see what happens when you don't do your job? You miss out on the rewards. And that word, the door was shut, it's a scary word. Kind of reminds us of the ark in Noah's day. Things change fast when you're not paying attention. Keep your head up, in other words. And keep your eyes on the puck. Because when you move, things can change very quick. Well, the bridegroom arrives in verse 10. And well... They were going to buy. The bridegroom came, right? They all proceed to the wedding in the torch-lit processional. And those who were ready went with them to the marriage feast. And then they all feast, as it says there. And the door was closed. Now, as you hear the text that they all went to this marriage feast, your mind ought to go back to other portions of Matthew's gospel. And what did Matthew's gospel tell us about marriage feasts? Well, Matthew's gospel tells us that these were delicious feasts. So, for example, if you look at chapter 22, verse 4, the parable of the wedding feast, chapter 22, verse 4 says, And again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. This is a glorious feast. Fat calves and the oxen have all been slaughtered. You know what this is telling us. I mean, you've got, you've got steak, right? And somebody decided to sear the roast beef so all the juice is kept on the inside. And there's gravy and there's potatoes and there's lots of butter and there's fresh bread and you can smell the fresh bread, right? And there's a nice glass of wine to clean your palate. And when it's all said and done, there's a very, very sweet dessert waiting for you, and they'll have the finest coffee that's brewed to wash it all down. When you hear this text that I'm, I'm quoting to you here in verse 10, and those who are ready went in with him to the marriage feast, you're supposed to picture the marriage feast and the spread on the table, and you're supposed to start to salivate. I hope you're ready for lunch. This is the point. You're supposed to smell the smells. You're supposed to see the spread. 
And you're supposed to be this close to tasting it in your mouth. And why is that? Because you don't want to be one of the people upon whom the door is shut. You want to be on the inside, not on the outside. And what happens, just like in the days of Noah, they were feasting and drinking and being given in marriage, and the door was shut. And this all happens. And finally, the virgins return with their oil. I don't know how long they took. I mean, this might be morning time by now. I don't know where they would have found an open store to sell oil at midnight. Maybe they had to travel to another village. Who knows? But by the time they get back in verse 11, it's too little too late. Look at what it says. Afterward, so this is like kind of after the marriage feast maybe even. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. This, of course, should remind us of another passage of Matthew. Jesus is summing up a lot of Matthew. It should remind us of Matthew 8, verse 11. In chapter 8, verse 11, what does it say? It says, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He refuses to let them in. And so what happens, the picture is, is they're in outer darkness. There's no place for them at the table. There's no place for them in the, with the food. In verse 12, it says, But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Now again, that, those are haunting words. And those bring us back all the way back to the Sermon on the Mount. And what does Jesus say at the end of Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21? He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will. See how it is? Does the will? Does the will of my Father who is in heaven? And then Jesus says in Matthew 7, 23, in that same section, he says, and then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The outside of the wedding feast is reserved for the ones who don't do their task as disciples. Now you say, don't you believe in justification by faith alone? You better believe I believe in justification by faith alone. And I believe that justification by faith alone, I believe that that faith is a gift of God's grace. And I believe that God's grace is so powerful that it won't just give you saving faith, but it will produce the works of righteousness. And there will be a changed life. And anyone who doesn't have his lamp lit and isn't caught doing his job, anyone who doesn't have his lamp, lip, uh, lamp, lamp lip, lit is somebody who doesn't have the Spirit of God in their life. This is the point. There is no power of God. Nothing is left there. Sure, they looked like they had it for a season there. But Jesus goes to the point of these young virgins. The bridegroom goes to the point of these, with uttering these haunting words. I do not know you. Well, he knows who they are. I mean, he invited them to the wedding after all. To the wedding party. Goodness me. But he does not want to be associated with them in any way. They've brought so much shame to the bridegroom by not doing the task that he had tasked them with. He brings so much, they bring so much shame to him that he wants nothing to do with them. And so they're banging at the door, let us in and let us feast. We finally got our oil. Well, it's too little too late, young lady. I don't even know you. Be gone. The fact that they are young virgins ought to tell us something. I mean, who could be more sweet and innocent than a young lady? Like you could picture them knocking on that door asking to be little, you know, with their big eyes staring up, right? And their pretty dresses and their frillies in their hair. And, and these aren't unvirtuous women. They're called young virgins. So these are women of virtue. 
But the, and the fact that Jesus would use those young women, young virgins, pictured as they were, all done up on this day of the wedding, these innocent young girls with their big eyes staring, begging, let me in, and the master says, I don't know you, that indicates to me that there will be no mercy on judgment day. If he won't yet let those young girls in, he won't let you in if you're unrepentant. If that's the way he is with them, how is he going to be with you if you're unrepentant? And they didn't want to honor the groom. They failed to discharge their duties. They had one job. Light the lamps so the people can see the groom. Light up the streets so the people can see the groom. And the lights were out. How often in the Gospel of Matthew is a disciple described is somebody who simply does his duty and the false convert is the one who doesn't do. Doesn't do. In this day of antinomianism, people don't like that kind of talk. They want some type of hyper-cheap grace that doesn't convert the sinner. Some grace that provides belief but doesn't provide heart change. But the grace that Jesus gives is the grace that changes the heart, that changes the action, that changes the person, that changes the world. That's the grace of Jesus Christ. And these young virgins didn't have it all as cute and virtuous as they were. They didn't have the grace of God, so they were left out. And this brings us down to one lesson. It's a very simple lesson, verse 13. Watch therefore, for you do not, or for you know neither the day nor the hour. Be ready. It's, it's a real shame, you know. They didn't listen to Jesus. In chapter 24, verse 36, where it says, But concerning the day and the hour, no one knows. Or they didn't listen to Jesus in chapter 24, verse 44, where it says, Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. They didn't listen to him in verse 42 where it says, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. They didn't listen to him in verse 50 where it says, The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour. He does not know. They didn't listen. How many times has Jesus said it? You don't know the day nor the hour. 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 You don't, you, like on and on and on. Be ready, 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 be ready. I hope you get the point, and I hope you get the strong warnings, and I hope you picture those young girls outside of that wedding party crying with tears in their eyes, running down their makeup on their faces, wishing they'd be ready, and Jesus looks at them and says, I do not know you. Picture that in your mind, and understand that there will be no grace and there will be no mercy for the impenitent on Judgment Day. Then it will be too late. Now is the time to get ready. Not tomorrow, not the next day, not 10 minutes from now. Right now, while you can hear me preaching, be ready. Get right with God. Don't waste any time today. Are you ready? I'm asking you, are you ready? I'm not asking the person next to you. I'm asking you, are you ready? If you can hear my voice, are you ready? It, it, it's so tragic, by the way, what happened to them. Why is it tragic? Well, look how close they were. So close. They got the invitation. Not just an invitation to a wedding, but to the wedding party. How many times are you invited to be in a wedding party? Not too often, especially for a young woman of that age. Right? They got the invitation. They got all dressed up. They got dressed up. Hair done, makeup done, picked out the dress, put the dress on, and they even had their lamps. Even the lamps they had. But they did not take the responsibility serious enough to bring along extra oil so they weren't ready. How many are like that? You know, you can come to church, but not be ready. So close, though. You can say your prayers, 
but not be ready. So close, though, so close. You might even know some scripture. You might even understand the gospel. You might even say some right things. You might even do some right things. You might even believe some right things. So close, but still not ready. Are you ready? Because they were so close. Oh, they were close. Could you imagine for all of eternity reflecting on the fact that you were within a hair of being invited and being at the wedding feast? But you missed it by a hair. Oh, if I just got that oil. Oh, I wish I hadn't given that 30 seconds to the devil in that one moment. Are you ready? You won't be able to rely on the faith of your parents or your friends. And these are, these are young people. So pay attention, young people, children and teenagers. You think, well, I'm just young. I don't need to worry about this. This is a parable about young people, young girls, little girls. Listen to me. Are you ready? Are you ready? Pay attention. Your tears will not work on Judgment Day. When you look into God's face, there will be no mercy if you're not ready. I think that's why Jesus chose to pick young girls to illustrate the fact that nobody will be showing mercy if they're not ready on that day. Not even the most sweet and innocent that you could imagine. And the dry wicks provide temporary glimmers. Do you know that? What do the dry wicks provide? You can light a dry wick on the lamp or on the, on, the, on the torch, and it will probably burn for 30 seconds to a minute, from what I've read, but it will die pretty quick. And that tells me that there's, there's such a thing as false conversion, that there's people that light up for the Lord really quick, but their lamps die out fast. And they're ready, they think they are, but then they're not, alas, because their lamp is dead. Dry wicks give temporary glimmers, and that in and of itself is a parable on its own. I didn't ask if you had a conversion experience. I didn't ask if there was once a time in your life where it looked like you were saved. I'm asking right now, are you ready? Stop looking back to that day when you had some type of flaming experience for Jesus and you felt excited. Oh, I was glowing for the Lord. Are you glowing for the Lord right now? Right now is the torch lit. That's what I'm asking. And by the way, there is a direct correlation between actions and consequences. And these young ladies didn't understand that. They thought that if they messed up, they figured if they messed up, they might find someone else who'd help them out. You, I, I really think it's an important thing as parents to not shield your children from negative consequences associated with bad behavior. Do you know how many parents do their children a disservice? Oh, I'm just going to shield my little precious from from bad consequences for their bad behavior. Well, if that's what you're doing, you're teaching them that you might be able to shield them on Judgment Day, and you won't. So, so let them feel the full weight of their responsibility. Let them feel it. And then teach them that valuable lesson. Oh, yeah, you know what? That hurt, didn't it? Well, it'll hurt even more if you don't listen to me and get yourself ready with the Lord. Eventually, you're going to learn that there's, a, there's, a, there's an association between actions and consequences, but I really hope it's not too late. I really hope it's not too late. And, and, and notice this. I think this is the most striking thing. Notwithstanding the fact that these are young, precious girls, not the fact that they're innocent virgins, but not that. I mean, that, to me, that's shocking. But, but I think the most shocking thing in this text is there's a 50-50 split. To me, that, that just floors me. You have these 10 people who are wholesome, who are beautiful, who look innocent and are, who are dressed up for the wedding, who have the torches, who were invited to be in the wedding party, and only 50% of them make the cut. That ought to tell you something right there. David Dixon, the Puritan, said, is among the virgins in the parable, so in the visible church. All are not wise Christians. Charles Spurgeon said, our Savior would not have spoken of so great a proportion if there were not really a very large mixture of foolish professors 
with the wise possessors of the grace of God. How many right now aren't ready? How many are right now are dressed up and looking good like Christians? How many right now are even virtuous people who have good morals? How many are attracted to the church because the church has good morals, but they are not born again? I'm not asking you if you have good morals. I'm not asking you if you're virtuous. I'm not even asking you if you have a wholesome home. I'm asking you, are you born again? Are you ready? That's what I'm asking. How many are not ready right now? How much of the church is not ready? You know, a lot of people don't like these warnings. I've heard complaints before. Don't give these warnings. I don't like it. Give me more about love. Give me more about grace. But I'll tell you, they'll wish they heeded them on Judgment Day. They'll wish they listened to them on Judgment Day. Are you ready? And there'll be many on Judgment Day who'll be thankful for said warnings. Thankful for them. Are you ready? The 19th century Southern Baptist John Brada said, the way to be ready when Jesus comes the way to be ready when Jesus comes is to be ready always. Amen. 